standing next to um, my boss, the Transportation Commissioner, and behind him are the two heads of the two big business improvement districts in, in uh, this part of the city who maintain and take care of these spaces for us. This, uh, that red thing behind him is actually the ball that drops on New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> um, a little bit more eye candy for you. Uh, a couple of years ago, we started this project. This is a historic building uh, further down Broadway from Herald Square called the Flatiron Building. Same set of issues, huge crossings, complicated intersection, Broadway crossing Fifth Avenue, didn't make any sense, beautiful park next to it. So um, we rationalized um, this intersection as well. Um, but now it looks like this. Um, people love this project, it works great. It focuses the taxis and the cars to get out the avenues, which is exactly where they actually want to be. Um, before we even put in the tables and chairs, when we just put out the orange cones and resurfaced the street that we were going to um, put down a new surface on, people came out and started to use it. There's a huge latent demand for public space in New York City, and this kind of this picture proves it. And we find this to be to be true everywhere we go. Um, here's a project in Brooklyn where there is sort of an auto line streets used for parking, little triangle that was used for parking. This is not the photo on the um, right. It's not a uh, it's not a photo simulation. Not that site uh, taken from the Manhattan Bridge, which is uh, virtually underneath. Um, so we've been able to do this program all over the city. None of these projects are capital projects. We have a capital program to do this work. It takes five years from inception to completion. These projects deliver in a matter of months. And then people understand what they're getting. They get it right away. We create a rationale for doing it. They appreciate the space immediately. We're getting all kinds of dividends from doing this kind of um, other things that we're doing besides public space, um, also non capital, but there are capital elements. Um, we've done bus rapid transit as an implementation program. We retrofitted our metro car machines that service the subways to, take, to do off board fare collection um, for buses so that you pay before you get on the bus, and then the buses can load through both doors very quickly. Nobody has to pay uh, when they're on the bus. We have transit signal priority, so the light stays green for a bus when it approaches an intersection. Um, moves them along faster. Travel times um, are down uh, almost 25% on this big corridor in the Bronx where we first instituted this. We painted the lanes red. We lifted up the, the parking regs. We have uh, large ridership increases, and people love it. So we're starting to do it in Midtown now. This is another project that we have on 34th Street in Midtown, which is where the Empire State Building is, and Macy's, and um, Penn Station. So we're working to do a bus rapid transit um, and do a busway on 34th Street. This will be a capital project eventually, but it's being implemented non-capital and then will be built out capital. Um, we're also looking at a huge program on the east side of Manhattan on 1st and 2nd Avenues. This will also incorporate bike lanes. This will be a great complete street. Um, when we're finished, it'll have a separated bikeway down one side and a, um, and a bus lane, priority bus lane, with this uh, select bus service on the other side, but we have to allow access to the curb so the bus lane will run right down the curb. We'll have these boarding rounds that you see in this um, visualization. Um, on the protected bike lane front, um, we built um, 15 miles of protected bike lanes in New York City over the last three years. Um, these are in Midtown um, on 9th Avenue. They run um, right, right up and down one of the major avenues in Midtown. There's one on 9th Avenue. There's now one on 8th Avenue. Just for example, we've been able to do these projects because the streets are over-designed. They don't need to carry. They don't need um, to have these many lanes. And crashes go down of all kinds. Pedestrians, bikes, everything. Everyone is safer when we put in bike lanes. It's one of our mantras. Is, you know, we're, 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 we're traffic calming and getting speeds down, and the bike lanes are our highest and best use of the space that is left over when we, when we redesign the street for the appropriate speed. They also generate a lot of bike volume. <laughs> um, this is Grand Street. This is another, as you can see, just done with green, and green paint and thermoplastic. Um, we've created a floating parking lane so people could still park on this busy commercial corridor downtown. The bikes now have a direct route to get to one of our key bridges that bring them from um, Manhattan to Brooklyn or from Brooklyn to Manhattan. So we're really focusing on getting people to the bridges. Um, this is another one, this is a two-way that we created on Kent Avenue in Brooklyn. Again, it meets people from 
very busy bike friendly neighborhood called Williamsburg over, the, over um, the East River Bridges and into Manhattan. So they're very popular one. This is again before we painted the lanes, before we had appropriately marked it out, the construction bar was all up and people are using it. Um, happens all the time. Here's another one, um, a two-way, along a two-way median um, and on the Lower East Side. And um, to make this safe, we closed the cross streets as they came across cross um, so that there were no turning movements into the into the bike lanes um, and we had created a little bit of electric created a little bit of public space in the process so we just painted that out and brought in some tables and chairs and um, people sit down in the spaces that we created in the intersection uh, where the cars used to come through um, and here's one that we did capitally this connects right up to the Williamsburg Bridge um, 200 miles of bike lanes in three years um, building the network as fast as we can um, and in every possible way that we can think of um, to keep people connected in the city and to make sure that the routes are connected and people um, are safe on their bikes. And the, so the result of that is this is a little close up of downtown Lower Manhattan and, um, and the East River bridges that connect over to Brooklyn and Queens. And you can see the network is quite built out now in that area, which is, which is really driving our, um, our bike numbers up. Um, work on bike infrastructure. We have a brand new beautiful bike rack, which we did through a design competition. Um, we have we retrofitted some of our bus shelters to be bike shelters, um, and we passed a new piece of legislation requiring property owners to provide um, bike parking in their buildings or let um, or let people bring their bikes up into their offices. Um, we also have aggressive ad campaigns uh, to try to keep people aware and motorists aware, bicyclists aware, pedestrians aware of everyone else, um, so that everyone's safe. And all this marketing um, has driven our bike numbers up quite nicely. Um, and we're really pleased with this, and we'd like to see this grow and grow and grow. I dare say there are a lot of bikes out on the street here in Toronto, and there are in New York, but um, we're working on it. Hopefully we'll catch up with you guys. Um, and as you uh, all know, um, as, uh, as, as the ridership goes up, um, the, the crash and the fatalities go down because people become more aware of bikes and, 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 uh, and that, that builds safety. That's another one thing that builds safety in the cycling. Um, so that's the implementation program that we've been doing so quickly. Now to rebuild the way that the city actually goes about planning and designing the streets, we developed the street design method. Um, I don't need to show you the slide because we just talked about it and Dan mentioned it, but this is exactly the way that we talk about it. It's 25% of the land area in New York City, and we need a good argument and a good case for how to design these in the best way. We talk about policy a lot up front, safety, mobility, access, context, livability, sustainability, visual excellence, and cost effectiveness. It's not so much more expensive, as Mark said, to do this stuff when you're already ripping up the street. So the point of the design manual is to say, every time you touch the street, look at it, because you don't have to put it back the way it was before, and that saves a lot of money and rebuilds your program as it goes along. Do what you can with paint, and then as you rip it up, put it back in concrete. Um, the design manual looks at lots of different kinds of things. It looks at geometric treatments, like medians, um, It'll define the term, it'll tell you sort of if you can use it widely or not, or if it's optional, kind of treatment. It defines it, talks about where it belongs, where it doesn't belong, um, what some sustainability options are for these things. Um, all kinds of, it doesn't give you specific specifications, but it'll refer you to any specifications that we already have in the city. Um, and it tries to unpack all this whole toolkit that we want to promote in the city so that it's not a mystery and that designers and con um, contractors, um, consultants, and, and in-house forces in the city, as they look to redesign the streets, they know what their options are, what their choices are, and where they're appropriate. Um, looks at different materials, including concrete, set, you know, granite sets, all different kinds of materials that belong on the street, where they're viable, where they aren't viable, um, what we think the Advantages are of using them in different contexts. Lighting, we rewrote our entire lighting catalog in New York City um, for the street design manual to look at different options, sustainable options, um, all different kinds of specs now for lighting that weren't there before. Um, street furniture like bike racks, bus shelters, newsstands, benches, um, 
secondary units. Then there's, of course, a section on trees and street trees. Um, and then overhauling the way that the city then reviews designs, because now we have a way of <laughs> analyzing everything is not an exception. Before, if you didn't put it back the way it was before, which is just, you know, we call it plain vanilla, just concrete, ask. Then, you know, oh, it's an exception, no, no, it's getting more expensive, it's this fit, it has to work. Well, you know, now we have a toolbox, and it explains where everything fits, and then the reviews should go much faster. So this is really encouraging for people who are working in the city working on the streets to know that all the different reviewing agencies have a metric to review their project by, and this should go much faster. Um, also, unpacking all the agency roles in the street. Um, this sometimes is my first slide, because it's just, you don't, you, could you say you control the streets near the DOT, but I mean, everybody has their finger in here, and, and, and there's, there's just an enormous number of variables to deal with when we're dealing with the street. The zoning regulations, the underground utilities, um, so we, we've tried to like lay all of this out in the manual so that people understand all the complexities of working in New York and what, what we have to deal with. We've also looked at our review process and what different channels that goes through and tried to codify that because projects were just kind of bouncing around the city, getting reviewed, um, getting reviewed thoroughly, getting reviewed safely, but not necessarily getting reviewed fast. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about before I stop is um, programming the streets. You can redesign them, you can rebuild them, you can work hard on doing all those things, but the quickest thing you can do is just put up, is just program them. So we've worked very hard on a program we call Summer Streets, which is um, seven miles of closed street through Manhattan. It connects to a bridge, over the Brooklyn Bridge, and it connects to Central Park. Um, people just get out and enjoy the street. There's a tremendous amount of programming that goes along with it. It's a huge impact on the city and on people enjoyment of the city and understanding what their streets can do besides just carrying them as transportation. And then we also have programs where we have applications where people apply to the city to close commercial corridors on the weekends or during special times. And we've laid out the criteria that we think that's appropriate, and then we let them come to us with their ideas. And I think it's really, really important in all of this work to always remember that if you can lay out your criteria for doing this kind of work, get your engineers and your city officials and people who permit these things comfortable with certain situations and you make that very clear to people and you lay it out, they'll come back to you with good ideas and good locations that conform to that criteria. And then it was their idea, it wasn't your idea. And it's not something that you're doing to them, it's something that they're really asking for. So um, that's, that's my bag of tricks. <laughs> <laughs>